Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Marco Andrejic, uh, Ukrainian Studies Program here at the Harriman Institute, Columbia University. Uh, thank you for joining us. Um, it's one of our final events for this fall semester. Uh, I believe, Yuri, you have a film event coming soon. Oh, Can yes. you maybe say a few words about that? It's brilliant. Uh, the Ukrainian Film Club will have a very special event on the 7th of December, and it's going to be uh, the screening of a brand new Polish documentary called The, the Hamlet Syndrome. It just uh, premiered, it had its American premiere at New York Documentary Film Festival. It's a very powerful film about uh, young Ukrainian uh, uh, artists and particularly actors and the, the theater directors uh, kind of banding together to resist the Russian invasion. A fantastic film. Please uh, mark your calendars uh, and be the first one to watch it. And we are going to have a discussion by Zoom with the director of the film, Elvira Nigera, and uh, Piotr, uh, uh, I forgot his part, found the name. But, but they are going to be joining us from, from Poland this kind of film. Uh, so. All right, thank you, Yuri. Uh, today's event is action packed, and we have uh, so many speakers. So we uh, want to get to the to the start. Um, I will be introducing uh, the speakers before they speak, but I will be doing abbreviated uh, introductions of their biography. But all that information uh, is on our website, so you can learn more about our distinguished panel. And they've done so many things that it's worth going and reading it. But I'll just tease you with some of the things. Uh, today's uh, event is entitled The Enduring Resonance of Carol DeVell's Ukrainian Origins and Musical Contexts. It's co-sponsored by Institute Low College and the Ukrainian Contemporary Music Festival, which we'll talk about a little bit later today, uh, the big event coming. Uh, our first presenter will be presenting basically, uh, it'll be a video presentation uh, by Tina She's a research fellow at the Hrushevsky Institute of Ukrainian Archaeography uh, and Historiography at the National Academy of Sciences Ukraine, uh, 2021 Fulbright Scholar in New York, and the author of an original study on the history of the song Shedder, Carol DeVell. Tina initiated the commemoration of this centenary of Ukraine's cultural diplomacy and the European premiere of Shedder in 2019. So uh, we will now watch uh, a video that Tina prepared, which will give us a really nice background for uh, other aspects of this topic that we'll be getting into in the next hour and a half. And become a true symbol of Christmas. It was performed in the world's best concert balls. The popular Christmas song, Carol of the Bells, the song without which it would be hard to imagine Christmas as such. The foreign old can be easily recognized by almost anyone, bring closer together different parts of the world, from the North Pole to Antarctica, from Australia to Alaska. However, it is little known that even though the Carol's famous lyrics were written by the popular American conductor Peter Wachowski, the author of its music was a Ukrainian conductor and composer, a true genius, Nikola Leontovich. And it was an ancient Ukrainian New Year's folk song called Shabdin that became the foundation of this masterpiece. Centuries ago, Ukrainians considered spring the beginning of the new year. That's why the folk lyrics of the song mention swallows, the heralds of the season. Within a hundred years, the Ukrainian song has spread all over the world, turning it into an unofficial anthem of Christmas. But before that, Shabdin has gone a long way becoming the symbol of the Ukrainian fight for independence from Russia. The year is 1919. The First World War has just ended. At the Paris Peace Conference, the victorious country was trying to create a new world order. In his famous 14 points, the American president, Woodrow Wilson, affirmed the inalienable right of peoples to self-determination. In the background of these epoch-making events, the Baltic states, South Caucasus, Poland, Czechia, Finland, Ukraine, and other states received hope for a just post-war solution to their national aspirations. The Ukrainian National Republic, which was literally rising from the ashes, declared its independence. Your parents' old dream has come true. From now on, the Ukrainian National Republic becomes independent from everyone, the free sovereign state of the Ukrainian people. But the major countries in Europe and America did not share the enthusiasm of Ukrainians. 
and that was exploited by the proficient Russian propaganda machine that was trying hard to convince the world that Ukraine didn't exist. And until Lenin's political descendants credited him with the invention of the country, the Russian ministers at the time were claiming that Ukraine was devised by the Austrian general staff. Not willing to recognize Ukraine's independence, Soviet Russia started a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Not only the eastern regions of Ukraine were soon occupied, but also the capital, Kiev. On the eve of the invasion, Simon de Tura, Ukraine's leader at the time, sent a flyer on a cultural quest to Europe. Just as in today's events, while struggling to match the military power of the opponent, Ukraine realized that the only chance to survive as a country is to win the information war and to recruit the countries of Europe to support Ukraine. So, while realizing the significance of the threat, Simon Petruda began to look for ways to remind the world that Ukraine had not only existed for a long time, but it had also done so separately from Russia. It's not a common fact that Petruda, just as Volodymyr Zelensky many years after him, had an artistic background. Before the war, the head of state and commander-in-chief of the Ukrainian army was an art critic, theater reviewer, and columnist for theater for years. Therefore, it was decided that one of the directions of the Ukrainian cultural diplomacy should be the most universal medium of all, capable of crossing any borders, the music. Simon Petruda summoned a composer and conductor, Alexander Korshitz, and ordered him to gather a choir within a week. Practically a talent show was organized to find the best choirist. Against the will of its creator, the Shkatnik song also made its way into the choir's repertoire. Why against the will? Well, the composer Mikola Leontovich was very hard on himself. A humble music teacher from Kuchin, a small town in the Padilla region, Leontovich destroyed many of his scores and worked on Shkatnik's melodic part for 10 years. And yet, a song set out around the world like a swallow. The first triumphant concert of the Ukrainian Republican Choir took place on May 11, 1919, in the capital of Czechoslovakia, Prague. Along with Shkatnik, the choir performed other pieces by Nikola Lithenko, Kirill Tetsenko, and Alexander Korshitz, the choir's very conductor. But all listeners from Vienna to Brussels, from Barcelona to Paris, were in love with the Shkatnik carol. Shkatnik is one of the most beautiful songs of the program. The London magazine for Punch Road, a masterpiece of Old Park. A columnist of the Brussels newspaper, the Vintian Siakin, admired the carol. In Vienna, the media summarized Ukraine's cultural maturity must legitimize its political independence for the world. Simon Petruda's strategy worked. In the following years, the Ukrainian choir kept gathering queens, presidents, ministers, academics, and professors in concert halls. The Ukrainian choir is in 10 countries, gave more than 200 concerts, and caused a real boom. Shkatnik was translated into many different languages. Across concert halls, audiences were channeled. Long live Ukraine! There were more than half a thousand reviews in 10 different languages about Ukraine and Ukrainian music. This was the result of the European tour of the choir. Hundreds of foreign artists, politicians, and public figures were sending letters to the choir in support of Ukrainian cultural and political agencies. Meanwhile, a real catastrophe was taking place in the homeland of Shkatnik. While the Ukrainian National Republic was winning on the cultural front, its military attempts to force back thousands of Bolsheviks and the armies of the whites who tried to restore the Russian Empire failed completely. Despite all hopes, the military support to Ukraine was not provided, and for the next 70 years, the country became occupied by Soviet Russia. The political repression started. Murders of Ukrainian intelligentsia were branded as purges of those who disagreed with the regime. Simon Petrus suffered a similar fate. He was killed in the middle of the street in Paris. In 1921, Nikola Leontovich was also killed by an agent of the All-Russian Extraordinary Commission. Leontovich's music was declared as irrelevant for the Soviet reality, and the memory of the composer faded for many decades. But Alexander Korshitz's choir continued to live, and so they gathered. In 1922, the choir reached the Western Hemisphere. And not just some place, but the most prestigious concert venue, Carnegie Hall. That same night, for the first time ever, Americans heard the melody of their future favorite Christmas hit. What followed next were concerts in more than 100 American cities everywhere. Shkadnik was the only for. As in Europe, Leopoldovich's carol is not only a tour hit, but also a symbol of the Ukrainian fight for independence. Sing, Sir Volume Ukraine. Sing, Little Bird. The spring you're waiting for will come. Brazilian academic. 
Enric Cuello Neto rode out to the premiere of Shelly in Rio de Janeiro, but Ukrainians had to wait for a while for their spring. Russian winter is raining on their lap. The Kremlin is continuing to erase Ukrainian intelligentsia, star Ukrainian peasants, and consistently destroyed anything that could remind the world of Ukraine. However, Shadley preserved the memory of its homeland. In 1936, the American composer and conductor of Ukrainian descent, Peter J. Wolhowski, added Shadley to the repertoire of his school choir and presented the song on a popular NBC radio show. After the premiere, American music teachers bombarded Wolhowski with requests to send the sheet music of Shadley. In November 1936, he published the song in the New York music publisher, Carl Fischer Music, calling it Carol of the Bells. In the score, he notes, this is a Ukrainian Christmas carol. Music by Nikola Leonkovich, lyrics and arrangement of Peter Kukowski. That's how a Ukrainian swallow turned into American bells. In Shadrach became Carol of the Bells. The melody of Nikola Leonkovich first became a Christmas anthem in the U.S. and later in the entire world. To this tune, people play basketball, make movies, celebrate Christmas, and make content for TikTok. In the UK, Shtetlik is sometimes called the New Year's Serenade. In Latin America, a song of great magic. And in Canada, a newly discovered space. Why did the work of the Ukrainian composer become so popular? This melody is pioneered. It spans from the times of paganism, when the surrounding nature was a source of people's inspiration to the era of American Hollywood. It creates box office gifts such as Harry Potter, Die Hard, the Immortal Simpsons, and many, many more. Even among Ukrainians, very few people knew about the true origin of this masterpiece and its important cultural and political mission. Many heard the song for the first time in the Home Alone movie released in 1990. For almost a century, Stradlik lived across the Atlantic, where the song became a Christmas anthem uniting people from their faith. A hundred years later, a missile of those same Russian occupiers hit a residential building in Kiev, located on Oleksandr Korshik Street. Russia is attempting to replay its absurd record about denazification and the lack of grounds for Ukrainian statehood. But this time, the world has no doubts in Ukraine's sovereignty, owing, among other things, Shtetlik's contribution a century ago. The foundation of cultural diplomacy created by Simon de Fura remains a pillar for today's successes. Ukrainian songs and culture in general continue bringing new victories that enforce and supplement gains in other areas, diplomatic and military, to help Ukrainians defend their home and secure the main victory, the victory of life over death, freedom's triumph over subjugation. Thank you so much, Tina, for, for providing that uh, wonderful video, which gave us a real just a background for our discussion today. Um, our next uh, speaker, speakers will be presenting in unison, uh, and they are um, Yepan Yefremov and Maria Solovetska. I will introduce them briefly, and then uh, Yepan is in cave. I think he's on Zoom listening. Uh, I believe so. Hello. Uh, and Maria will be presenting what they've come up with together. So you have you have professor of ethnomusicology at the Cave Academy of Music. His role in the revival of regional Ukrainian folkloric repertoires that were ignored or censored during the Soviet era cannot be underestimated. Professor Yefremov's doctoral research in Cave and Police led him to work with the State Emergency Service of Ukraine after the Chernobyl catastrophe of 1986. In that capacity, he continued researching the traditional repertoires from that region and study the song practices of many resettled villagers in their post Chernobyl homes. And Maria Sonovitsky is Associate Professor of Anthropology and Music at Bard College. Her research focuses on post Soviet Ukraine, where she has pursued interests including folklore revivals after state socialism and the effects of the Chernobyl nuclear disaster on the revival of rural music repertoires in 2011 to commemorate the 20th. 25th anniversary of the Chernobyl nuclear catastrophe. She founded the Chernobyl Song Project, Living Culture from a Lost World. She's the author of Wild Music, Sound and Sovereignty in Ukraine, 
She taught at Bard for several years, beginning in 2014, and then taught in the music department at the University of California, Berkeley. Please, Maria. Thank you so much, uh, It's nice to be here. Thank you uh, to Leah and Pedazo for these uh, Herculean efforts in making this event happen this weekend and this event today as well. So I am here to present research that is really um, Professor Gifremov's research primarily. I'm going to be here as translator and presenter and adding a little bit of context myself. Um, and so my aim in this just very brief presentation is to address some of the origins and sources of inspiration for Leon Tovich's work. So we just heard that fly by quickly in this lovely video. Um, but I want to linger on that moment a little bit. Where did the name Shedrick come from? What does it mean? And what is the broader social context in which Shedrick um, existed in Ukraine? That worked, yay. Okay, so um, the name Shedrick refers to a rite of generosity, Shedruvanya. And Shedrivki are calendrical ceremonial songs of generosity. The root, the common root here is Shedr meaning generous. Leontovich's Shedrik is heavily indebted to the culture of Shedrovania in Ukraine and also to the basic and formal melodic motifs of many, of many Shedrivki. So I want to play one short fragment that comes from Professor Yefremov's research, which should make this point quite clear. This is a recording from 1998 of Peri or people who were resettled after the Chernobyl disaster. Um, and it's just a 40 second clip. If you understand the Ukrainian, you'll also hear that some of the lyrical tropes we associate with Shadruki are also here. Would you mind activating that? <laughs> So you can tell there's humor in this if you can, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. Shedyuki would have been sung during Shedri Vechir, uh, which has in a ceremonial ritual at night that has many names. It's also called Malanka. People call it the Old New Year. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Professor Yefremov writes, and here I'm quoting, our ancestors called the evening before the New Year generous, because they celebrated at a rich table filled with a variety of festive foods and bread. And that would include, of course, Shedra Kutya, which is a highly symbolic wheat berry kind of pudding porridge dish that many of you might be familiar with. Um, and in contrast to the plain or poor Christmas kutya, the shedra kutya would include uh, more dried nuts and cream, making it generous. Um, and bread was also treated with special respect because it was considered a gift, a generous gift from the land itself. Um, before I move on, I'm just going to uh, linger for a moment on this image, uh, which we heard about in the in the previous video. So this is the last flower of the swallow, which is referenced in Leon Povich's text. And this also importantly cues us to the archaism of the ritual, right? Shedrik, shedrik, shedrivochka, prilatila, laskivochka. We know that swallows don't arrive in January, they arrive in mid-March. And that is part of the reason that it's believed that this ritual is actually has pre-Christian origin. Um, Malanka, the way that it's celebrated, often has these carnivalesque, is a carnivalesque ritual event, and it shared much in common with the holiday Purim, which remains uh, celebrated in March. So that's kind of an interesting thing to consider. Um, so some quick ritual context um, here. So where Christmas is considered a Christian holiday, uh, the New Year is coded as a secular holiday. For Ukrainians, they are both marked by ritual and ceremonial songs. So for Christmas, those would be the carols or kuyakti, which often have an explicitly Christian thematic or a biblical message. In the new year, they would be shedrivki, these songs of generosity. Um, but of course, the distance between these two events today is usually only a week apart. So there's this calendrical proximity, right? Um, that people speculate may have contributed to the ritual similarities here. Um, the basic theme of the rites is the same, in which a group of people travels um, around the village, uh, bringing each homeowner a song of generosity, wishing them all the best in the new year, and then they are rewarded 
with sausage, with lard, with salvo, you know, hurilka, um, or whatever, um, and in the modern day, also sometimes with money. Um, but the main difference between Kola Duvanya or caroling and Shedruvanya is that the Christmas rite is generally much more aesthetic. Um, it's accompanied by the singing of these Chris Christian carols, while the New Year's rite tends to be much more diverse in its forms regionally and locally, and then can include a lot of humor and actually comedic episodes. Um, the songs also have practically no Christian thematics. Um, so for evidence of the pre-Christian um, origins of the Shadrivka, I apologize here, I'm operating two different systems at once. Okay. Um, okay. Um, nope. <laughs> so for the ritual, uh, the evidence of pre-Christian origins, um, Ukrainian folklorists and ethnomusicologists have noted that um, shadyuki don't correspond, right, to church-based musical materials. Um, lyrical themes may include things such as the origins of the world, mythical heroes, fantastic animals that speak human languages, etc. cetera. Um, and then also there's the belief widely held that Shedri Vechir also would call deceased ancestors to their living relatives. And this was both desired um, because it meant that the new year would uh, more surely have um, positive uh, things accompanying it. And then finally, only the more recent carols or kodatki, so those that have been dated to the last 300 years or so, have explicitly biblical content. And this also suggests that caroling itself, kodatubanya, may also have had pre-Christian roots. So um, I wanted just to quickly show you some images. We, we mentioned the regional diversity of, of, these, um, of these winter rituals. And uh, this is an image of the Kulevniki from Kriborivnya, which is a kind of iconic village in the Hutsul region of Ukraine. Um, these are the Kulevniki who have traveled from the village of Kriborivnya many times to the village of New York City um, at the invitation of Vyblana <laughs> Tkach of the Yara Arts Group. Um, and as you can also see in this image, Kulevnya and Shtadruvanya both are really associated with men's groups, um, especially in Hutsulishchina. But it's important to note that in many regions of Ukraine, this also started to shift after the midpoint of the 20th century. So um, here I'm showing you some of the amazingly precious um, images from Professor Yevtremov's research. Um, and so these are kind of contrasting scenes. These are scenes from Shtedny Vechir, also known as Malanka or Vasily Vechir, as I mentioned. And these are scenes from northern Polisia, which is the ethnographic region where Professor Yevremov has concentrated his research. Um, Malanka is this carnivalesque evening where people dress in costumes. And this thing that I translated very badly, Mundinya uh, the guiding of the goat, <laughs> um, is a ritual that is also <laughs> widespread in much of Eastern Europe. Um, and is also likely a pre-Christian ritual that melds music with theater. Um, it often stages the death and resurrection of the goat, which is this kind of agrarian magical metaphor for the renewal of the year and the prediction of the future bounty. Um, but it has also developed an often kind of slapstick comedic um, practices alongside. So here um, you can see just some of these images. These are photos from field expeditions conducted in 1980. Um, which also just shows us how these rituals were still being performed in Soviet Ukraine. And I think that's an important thing to note here as well, the continuity of these practices. Um, so I want to, we want to here uh, pause for a moment also on the practice of children's Shedrubanya. And of course, this weekend's concert will feature the Shedrub Choir from Ukraine. Um, because this is a really important part of this ritual story as well. Children um, aged four to 10 years old are regularly kind of brought into these rites of generosity in different regions of Ukraine. So Professor Yefremov explains that on New Year's Eve, it happens like this. The children go into the yard. They approach a window behind which the host family has gathered in the house at the feast table. And the children will, will perform Shidriyufkid, so these traditional texts with quite simple short melodies on two to three sounds, four pitch kind of cycles. And the melody then repeats until the end of the song. So to underscore here, the tunes are quite simple, right? They only have two to four notes. And this is much like the basis upon which Leon Tovich builds his composition. The children are very young. They're not trained singers. And then additionally, this is happening outside in the cold uh, <laughs> through a <laughs> window. 
And so, um, so in order to be heard, the children learn to sing very loudly as a group. And people even say that this can't really truly be called singing, which is why in Eastern Kurisa, they say, they're not singing, they're giving, performing this rite of generosity. Um, and so the main thing here also is the power of the sound that is this kind of very sharp timbre and this joint rhythmical coordination. Um, so ethnomusicologists have in Ukraine have archived many recordings of various children's shibuki, but they're mostly recordings made by adults who themselves once were children and then passed this ritual down. And what I want to play for you right now is another short 20 second clip from Professor Yevrebov's uh, recordings um, made in 1979. So you'll hear a male vocalist recalling a shibuki from his own childhood. Добрий вечір, добрий вечір, а господи, там де русський бог нас посла, а ти мені куба, люба, а ти швиді, і не лежиш, а ти не so I will end, uh, we'll end here, um, and just to point out that in Leontovich's composition, we hear the various techni techniques and means of expression obviously developed by generations of European and Ukrainian um, elite composers, so techniques of harmony, counterpoint, juxtaposition, dynamic. But the basic motif is this very simple four-pitch melodic phrase that, as you've now heard, is a kind of quintessential gesture of the Shibiyupa. Um, someone unfamiliar with this source could, of course, still enjoy Carol of the Bells or, or Shedrick and be un unaware of its deeper meaning or of its historical significance for Ukrainians in many regions. But it is our hope in presenting this that something of the origins of this allows us to imagine the fullness of the social world from which these rites of generosity sprang over the course of over a thousand years. So I invite you now to imagine the many participants, the snowy landscape the children singing on the border of yelling, slicing through the moonlit village night. And I invite you to immerse yourself and your imagination in this atmosphere the next time you hear the composed version of Shtadrik. And in doing so, to imagine these songs of generosity as they have and will continue to resound, war be damned, and not only in Ukrainian villages and cities of the present, but in all variety of venues from humble school auditoriums to street corners, to the most prestigious elite halls in New York and other places around the world. Thank you, Yakuyu. And I want to just also say that I hope Professor Yefemov will remain for the Q&A, so if there are questions, we can try to make that happen too. Thank you so much. Hey, well, Professor Yefemov and, and my Professor Zlovetsky. Uh, our next presenter is uh, conductor Marie Kuzma, who has led concerts around the world, Cave, Montreal, New York, Vienna, and has collaborated with many, many artists and ensembles. She directs choirs at the University of California, Berkeley for some 25 years, where she also taught classes in conducting and in music history. A scholar of Slavic music, she has published articles in the Choral Journal and in Journal of Musicology. She's published a critical edition of Bodnyansky uh, Choral Conceptos and made several recordings of works by Bodnyansky, Dichko, and others. She has also appeared as an actor on stage and in film and today as a presenter. So welcome. Thank you so much. What a privilege to be here, truly. Um, today I'll be sharing my reflections on the place of Shtedrik within the context of Western classical music. So even though Ukrainian carols were some of the first songs I ever sang, and Ukraine was my, my first language. When I worked at past tense at the University of California, Berkeley, most of the music I did was by the Western European canons. So Bach, Mozart, Brahms, Messiaen, Takemitsu. And, um, and now within the context of this anniversary, I'm reevaluating Shadrach and how it fits within that panoply of composers. Um, so how does Mikola Leontovich fit into the world of his fellow Ukrainians? and also the world of Western composers. And conversely, how are Leontovich and Shtadrik unique or anomalous within the larger canon of Western music? Shtadrik is in many ways miraculous. Miraculous in the way it went viral around the Western world. Uh, Tina Perasunko's book documents how tremendously popular these concerts were. And within those concerts, 
Shtedrik stood out as the favorite. They beg to hear it over and over again. And I don't know of any other short choral piece in the history of European choral music that has caused that kind of a stir. I also don't know of any other choral piece that has been used in so many scores around the world after that. Um, it, just incidentally, this year, as I was watching the TV series uh, White Lotus, I noticed and I thought, ah, oh, so bad. Um, so um, Shtedrik is miraculous, not just because it's popular or because it's catchy, but also in the way it stands on its own as a mini masterpiece among the more ostentatious works of its time. At the time that Leontovich was composing Shtedrik in the early 20th century, um, the Austrian composer Gustav Mahler was preparing for the premiere of his symphonic song, or German Lied, Das Lied von der Erde, the Song of the Earth. That Lied, or song, clocks in at about 65 minutes. Shadrick is about a minute and a half. So these two works are in some ways antipodes, one of huge length and forces, the other brief, and for just four voice parts, a cappella, a cappella meaning without instrumental accompaniment. And I'm reminded of a quote from a song by the German composer Hugo Wolf, who also lived at the same time as Leontovich. Wolf's song, Auch kleine Dinge, states that even small objects can be precious. And Stöbrich is one such precious miniature. Within those 1.5 minutes, Leontovich shows prodigious mastery of compositional techniques, as I'll describe in a moment. But first, I've been asked to provide a brief synopsis of all Ukrainian choral history leading up to Shtedrik. And I should specify that I'm focusing on notated choral music history. The folk tradition that Professor Sonovitsky uh, outlined has its own deep history in Ukraine that preceded and runs in parallel with the history of transcribed or formally composed choral music. In fact, the two traditions use in Shtedrik. But I will speed through the thousand years of Ukrainian notated choral music as best I can, and here goes. So Ukraine as a culture has absorbed many cultural cross currents throughout its long history. So as a country, this is true, and the same is true of its music. Uh, the two cultures that Ukraine most strongly incorporated into its notated choral music were Byzantine and Western European culture. In the 10th century, as any Ukrainian knows, um, Ukraine adopted Christianity from Constantinople, and its early sacred music was highly influenced by chant from Greece and Bulgaria. Fast forwarding 600 years, starting in the 16th century or the late 16th century, Ukraine adopted choral music trends from the West through Poland, the music of Roman Catholicism and the Reformation. And you may be asking, well, why, why sacred music? And this is because the very notation systems that enable people to write down music were developed in monasteries, whether in Western Europe or in Ukraine. The earliest notation systems allowed scribes in dark monastic cells to write down single lines of chant. And later on, notation systems like the one we've all seen, if we've ever had a piano lesson with five lines and uh, key signatures and, and measure them and, and uh, bar lines, those allow people to write down many lines of music or polyphonic music. Now, I'm not going to talk about 600 years worth of music right now. And largely it's because I don't think that music and the genres, the early genres, I would say are monodia, which is monody, cante, which is three voice um, choral singing, or patesni concerte, which are many voice singing. Those did not have a direct influence on Leontovich simply because that music was buried. Those manuscripts were buried in Russian uh, archives in the Russian Empire, in Moscow and St. Petersburg. And so they would not, uh, a composer in Leontovich's day would not have been cognizant of those pieces of music. However, the three voice vocal texture of Kante was also typical of folk singing. And that finds its way into Leontovich's music. The counterpoint of Patesni Concerte and counterpoint simply means voices interweaving or interlocking or overlapping. That technique found its way into Levin Povich's music. The music that Levin Povich definitely would have known by previous Ukrainian composers 
would have been by composers of the early, uh, of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. The music of a triumvirate of Ukrainian composers, Maxim Berezovsky, Mitro Borgnansky, and Artem Vavin. Borgnansky was particularly inventive in developing a genre called chorovi concert, or choral concerto. And for those of us who are familiar with the term concerto, we typically think of a violin soloist in the middle of a huge stage surrounded by instrumentalists and struggling to compete with the orchestra. Um, the word concerto, however, in the early Italian sense, just means forces competing with each other or working against, against each other or in concert with each other. So um, in, that, in that meaning, the concertos of Wartniansky meant that he used sometimes solo voices, tutti chorus, tutti just means everybody's y'all sing. Um, so solo, tutti, different groupings of voices and um, alternating different tempos. So that's what Gordnyansky developed. And he was very inventive with this, the way he developed the capacities of four voices, just four voice parts to have so many different kinds of timbres and what we call textures. And this very flexibility of choral texture influenced the choral music of all later Ukrainian composers, including Leontovich. We're still about 100 years away from Leontovich, but I'd like to mention now how these various contrapuntal techniques and how this choral flexibility are evident in Stavrik. Those of us who have sung it and conducted it forever, I think, at least myself, I took it for granted until I looked at it through a microscope. So to use musical terms of counterpoint, Stavrik has ostinato, which just means repeating the same mode over and over again. It has imitative counterpoint. It has inverted counterpoint. It has diminution. It has an unusual modal shift in the tenor line. It has a melismatic moment in the soprano. And in terms of shifting textures, the vocal lines move independently. They pair up. They come together homophonically for a climax and separate again. The song includes a little solo line at the beginning, and then it comes full circle to a codetta of a solo duet, and all within 40 measures. <laughs> and this virtuosity, the, the choral acrobatics in Stavrik that, that tease our ear and, and stimulate our brain in so many ways, I think this is one of the reasons why Leon Tavich and Stavrik so delights our musical ear and so makes us want to see it again. It's like, it's like an Olympic event. Wait. That, that triple axle, let's see it again. You know? So the mid-19th century, now moving ahead, just a generation before that one, Tavich brought a marked shift in classical music across the European continent, including Ukraine, the nationalist movement. In the preceding eras, the Baroque and classical eras of Western music, composers ruled in a, comp a cosmopolitan or international style. And just to give two examples, uh, the composer, the high Baroque composer Handel, uh, was born in Germany, but wrote Italian operas for English audiences. Mm -hmm. So such a mixture of languages. In the early 19th century, Beethoven, Berlioz, Bellini didn't quote folk melodies or tunes or signal their ethnicity in their symphonies or operas, but invented their own melodies. In the mid-19th century, composers across Europe deliberately quoted native tunes and identify their own music as representing their homeland. And a prime example of this is Antonin Borjak's uh, symphonic work, Mavlast, which means my fatherland. The com Ukrainian composer Mikola Lysenko, who is often called the father of Ukrainian music, was part of this movement. He visited villages across Ukraine to find and write down folk melodies. And then when he set verses of Ukrainian poets to music, he mimicked folk melodies in his invented melodies. And Lysenko composed songs almost exclusively to Ukrainian words. He then fostered a generation of composers who followed in his footsteps, among them Nikola Leontovich and his compatriots Kirill Svetsenko and Alexander Koshis. Um, all three of these were ethnographers, all three were passionate nationalists. And Stavrik is a musical product of that era and that ethos. Now, I've just outlined how Leontovich and Stavrik fit into the trajectory of Ukrainian and European music history. And here's how Ukrainian music deviates from that European norm. 
at first glance, music nationalism in Ukraine seems part, of, part and parcel of that larger European trend. But this movement was much more charged and more vital in Ukraine. Ukraine has quoted folk melodies and verses not just for inspiration, but for ethnic survival. They wrote songs with Ukrainian words at their own peril in defiance of an imperial edict. Tsar Alexander II in 1876 had banned the publication of anything, anything in Ukrainian, poems, books, and songs. After the Re Russian Revolution and the overthrow of the Romanovs, music nationalism was still seen as subversive in Ukraine, and tragically, Latin Kavich was even killed for it in 1921. Latin Tavich and his colleagues used folk melodies to assert that Ukrainian ethnicity existed at all and to preserve the language. I sing, therefore I am. I sing in Ukrainian, therefore this language exists. On a strictly technical musical level, the music of Latin Tavich and his compatriots is anomalous within European music in its very a cappella scoring. By the late 18th century, Western European composers and critics had given up on a cappella music, and, and they regarded short songs as secondary or, or unimportant. How many a cappella songs did Mozart or Beethoven compose? A handful. In Leon Tavich's day, how many did Mahler compose? None. Ukrainian composers wrote hundreds of short a cappella pieces and gave a cappella music primary status center stage, as it will be on Sunday night, this, this coming weekend. Now, why is a cappella music so central to Ukrainian culture in the era of Latin Tavich? Three, uh, three, three straightforward reasons. The first is related to ritual, sacred music tradition. The Orthodox Church and the Ukrainian Catholic or greco catholic Church don't allow instruments in church. So whereas Bach, Mozart, Verdi composed a multitude of sacred pieces with choral orchestral possibilities, Vilecki, Bodnyansky, Lysenko had to write their sacred music for voices alone. Second reason is economic. In Western Europe, the 19th century brought a rise of the middle class with chicken soup in every pot and a piano in every living room and a symphony orchestra in every major city. In Ukraine, Serfdom wasn't abolished until the middle of the 19th century. Monetary wealth was concentrated in Russia, and Ukraine didn't have its first orchestras until later. However, every Ukrainian church, university, city could have an a cappella course, and they did. And finally, there's a practical reason for the proliferation of a cappella music. Remember, Latin Tovich and his colleagues couldn't publish their songs because. They wanted to have Ukrainian words, and Ukrainian words couldn't be published. So what did they do? They wrote small-scale a cappella pieces for three or four, four voice parts only that they could teach to their singers by rote. And their songs were short and simple, but also creative and sophisticated, as is Shabdik. Latin Tavich, Sitsenko, and Kaushitz had such an intimate relationship with a cappella music. Many European composers of the day conceived their choral music at the keyboard. Leon Tavich grew up singing in church. They directed choirs. Their musical imagination came from their voices, not their fingers. And so it's interesting that often when I've shared Ukrainian choral music with colleagues, they look at the page, they play it on their pianos, and they think, ah, what's the big deal? And then they perform it with their choirs, and they say, wow because these composers knew what the resonance is created when they write choral music. So overall, here is how I see Shevich's place and Leon Tavich's importance in Western music. Western music regarded symphonies and operas as paramount songs, trifles. When Hugo Wolf composed his short solo song, Auch kleine Dinge, he was defending the value of small objects and simple songs, even small objects, auch, Small objects, too, can be precious, the song states. Leon Tavich and his Ukrainian contemporaries made no apology for their songs, and their vast a cappella repertoire flips this Western hierarchy on its head. Shedrick is a 
carol about a bird that sings to a farmer about the bounty of the earth. It reminds us today and will remind us on Sunday of the bountiful tradition of a cappella song in Ukraine. This song isn't a long song like Mahler's epic Das Lied von der Erde, Song of the Earth, and yet, like the bird that perches herself on a farmer's fence, Stavrik stands proudly, and this little carol contains within it a whole world. Um, our next speaker, Leah Bastone, is a musicologist working at the intersection of art, music, politics, and philosophy in Central and Eastern Europe. She currently holds a postdoctoral fellowship from the University of Vienna. She received her PhD in musicology from McGill University and holds a master's in musicology from the University of Oxford. Her first book, Mahler's Nietzsche, Politics and Philosophy in the Gerdenhorn Symphony, is forthcoming with Boydell and Ruler. And maybe you'll mention the details about the concert because you should talking about it. Absolutely. Um, so let's see if this, do you think this is long enough to, to do this from here? We can switch it. Uh, yeah, maybe that's easier. Yeah. Musical chairs here for a moment. No pun intended. <laughs> no pun intended. <laughs> um, yeah. <clears throat> All right, we'll see how this Okay. Um, yes. So uh, I will just say a few words about the concert. So I'm um, I'm the I should have put this in my bio, but I'm also the creative director of the Ukrainian Contemporary Music Festival, and we are one of the co-presenters of the concert that is happening on Sunday, along with Radom for Ukraine and the Ukrainian Institute in Kyiv. Um, and UCMF's role has been really to work on the things that are on the stage. So we've done a lot of consulting with experts on Ukrainian music, on choral music, including Mariko Kuzma and uh, scholars in Ukraine, and then a lot of um, thinking about who would be the best performers, what is what is kind of the message of the concert. One of the things we did land on was that it would be an all a cappella vocal concert as opposed to bringing in other elements. And I'm I would be delighted to answer any questions people may have about like the program itself. Um, but we can leave that for the Q and A. Um, so my my research, as Marco mentioned, uh, my first book is on Gustav Mahler. And I'm now working on a project about Ukrainian modernist composers. So I'm just going to say a few words about Lantovich's sort of influence on the generation that came after him. So Marika just gave an amazing um, history of Ukrainian choral music and how Lantovich fits into it. And he was incredibly significant also for the composers that followed and for the movements of music composition that, that followed him. Um, so Leopoldovich was not only the creator of perhaps the world's best known Christmas carol, and certainly America's most beloved Christmas carol, but he was also a celebrated composer in his own right, and he did exert a significant influence on musical and broadly cultural spheres around him, actually, when you look into um, the circles in which he moved, the people that knew him, um, the people that mourned him after his untimely death. He had an influence beyond musicians. He was he was well known in broader cultural um, circles. So his musical oeuvre is made up largely of vocal music and, in particular, a cappella choral music. I'm just repeating here what what Marika has just shared, um, and that as we heard also from Professor Yefremov and Marusia, that um, he drew a lot of inspiration from folk music, both texts and melodies. Um, he also wrote religious choral works. Um, including things for the liturgy. And um, like Mikola Lysenko, who sort of thought of as the father of Ukrainian music, who's a generation earlier than Leontovich, he also set Ukrainian poetic texts to music. So we still, we see this idea of singing Ukrainian words as a way of kind of establishing Ukrainian identity um, just in, in, in music and therefore in culture. Um, he even started to compose an opera, actually, which would have been the first Ukrainian opera on fantastical subject matter. Um, it's called The Mermaid's Easter, and I'll come back to that in a minute. It, he never finished it, partly because he was um, assassinated long before his time. According to the Canadian-Ukrainian musicologist Dagmara Turchin, 
Lantovich, along with Kirill Zdenko and Jakub Stepovi, belonged to this middle generation of composers, that's what she calls them. So they occupied this special place between the romanticism of Lysenko and the modernism of the composers that came after in who were writing in the 1920s and 30s. And Leontovich's influence on this latter group, as well on generations of later composers, including living composers today, was significant and far-reaching. Nine days after Leontovich's assassination by the Cheka, a group of young composers and cultural figures formed what was called the Leontovich Music Society in Kiev. And the society existed from 1921 until 1928. And its organizing committee is really interesting. It was comprised of a lot of illustrious figures that included Sotsenko, Vikivsky, Yatoshevsky composers, but also the ethnographers Clement Kvitka, who was the husband of Florosa Kosta Kvitka, or Lasse Ukrainka, um, Dmitro Rabutsky, who was the brother of the composer Lavko Rabutsky, the theater director Les Kurbas was in the organizing committee, as well as um, the poet Pablo Tichina. So this is, I mean, you can see that people who were sort of recognized and mourned and celebrated Leontovich went far beyond the music community. And, <clears throat> excuse me, um, poetry was dedicated to him by Maxim Brilsky and Mikola Bajan. So he, he was really like a figure in, in the cultural world in which he moved. Um, and in terms of the musical activities of the society itself, they were extraordinarily forward-looking. So in 1926, they served as the basis for the founding of the Association of Contemporary Music. Um, among the founding mem members was Boris Beatoshinsky, Lev Korovutsky, Berkiewski, and others. And they engaged and experimented with a wide variety of avant-garde approaches to music composition. So sort of in the name of Leontovich, there were this next generation, this younger generation of composers doing really cool, experimental, new things. Um, during its existence, the society produced the journal Musica that was published monthly in Kiev and for a short period of time in Kharkiv as well. And it covered topics such as Ukrainian music, ethnomusicological projects, music criticism, and sort of musical cultural life in Ukraine, biographies of various musical figures. And it had to be among the first journals of its kind to cover Ukrainian music so systematically and exclusively. Um, the society also hosted a number of events, concerts, meetings throughout Ukraine. Beginning in 1923, they started um, a, a series of Galician music evenings that were established to kind of focus on the works of Western Ukrainian composers like Stanislav Lukievich, Vasil Barvinsky, and Filaret Kulasa. Um, and Leontovich's influence over Ukrainian music remains visible. So the fact that many music society and schools are named either after Lysenko or Leontovich kind of puts these two, these two figures on sort of a pinnacle in the history of Ukrainian music. Um, the late 20th and early 20th century composer Miroslav Skorik was responsible for finishing Leontovich's opera, actually. And it was um, premiered, I believe, in Toronto in the early 2000s. So uh, again, a, a figure like Skorik, who is one of, certainly was one of the most well-known living composers, um, that he, one of his projects was to go back and finish something that Leontovich started really testifies to Leontovich's importance and his, you know, his significance in the mind of contemporary composers. And then also the journal Musica was reinstated actually in the 1970s in name. It went through sort of various changes and then in the 70s it became Musica again, and it's still, published, it's still a leading organ of musicological material in Ukrainian. Leontovich's choral ingenuity is justly celebrated. I will not even attempt to, <laughs> to um, cover again the things that, <laughs> that Marika just shared with us. Um, but I will point out that significant for the, for the generation that followed him was his ability to combine these Ukrainian folk singing techniques and texts into a genre of academic choral composition. And this is something that we see later composers kind of taking as a model. Um, so Lysenko did actually, you know, he had begun this tradition of Ukrainian art music. He had set Ukrainian texts in, in art music genres. He even arranged folk songs and, set, um, and settings. Yeah, folk, song, folk songs and settings. but. Leontovich kind of advanced this sort of national school of composing by using musical characteristics of folk music, but sort of making them the basis of a more academic kind of composition. 
So we heard about his incredible ingenuity in terms of counterpoint. In France, he actually earned the nickname the Ukrainian Bach. Um, so his works often have a lot of rich polyphonic um, polyphonic elements, and he was very interested in like the different choral, the ranges of the voice. So I actually wanted to just play a comparison of a Lysenko setting of a folk song to a comparison. They're not the same folk song. I couldn't find the same one, but a comparison of Lysenko to Leontovich, because I think it gives you a good sense of like what Lysenko did, which was super important and was sort of this first step, and then how Leontovich kind of took this to the next level and why it would have been so significant for composers that followed. I won't play all of it. Um, I'm just going to play a little bit of each. Um, this is Lysenko, and I've just put up the video so that you can see if, you, if anyone reads music so that you can see. Um, the music notes on the text. So <laughs> fairly simple and it has a it does have a, a orchestral or piano accompaniment which um, it, these songs didn't always and Leontovich's settings don't but I don't I think you can still sort of hear the difference if you overlook that. So this is this is a arrangement by Leontovich of a folk song. <laughs> starting with just tenor bass and then having the higher voices come in there's you know there's multiple things happening at different moments you have a lot of imitation in land language so it's sort of this i don't want to use the word elevation but i can't think of another word um but it's sort of this academic treatment of folk sources which was a significant influence for the generation of modernists that followed so among the composers that came after Leontovich, these modernists it's in the 30s, many of them utilized a kind of similar approach to establishing a Ukrainian school of composition. Um, so a kind of development next step on this sort of national school of late romanticism. So symphonic compositions, and particularly by Lovko Rudsky and Boris Yatoshinsky, use very similar means. Folk melodies, folk <laughs> motives form the basis of these big symphonic compositions. And so they sort of take this folk material 
and utilize it within these conventions of art music as a way of sort of infusing Ukrainianness into this art music tradition. Um, and combining it also with experimental approaches to composition that were that were common in the early 20th century. Um, many scholars of Ukrainian modernism and the visual arts have noted that there's this kind of combination between folk imagery, shapes, colors, motives, and their transformation in the work of visual artists into the various genres of impressionism, expressionism, these kinds of um, experimental treatments. Um, and this is a parallel that I think works really well with, with music as well. And so in this way, Lampovich laid the foundations for one of the richest and most diverse periods of Ukrainian art music composition. Um, Uh, our final uh, presenter today is Tetyana Pielowska, who is creative director of the Ukrainian Institute, which is Ukraine's cultural diplomacy organization. Tetyana's uh, art manager, curator, and writer. Her background is in philosophy with experience in contemporary art and Ukrainian art history of the 20th century. She is author of the books Kazimir Malevich, Cave Period 1928-1930, which I love a copy. It's a wonderful book. Thank you for that. Kazimir Malevich, Cave Aspect and uh, Dmitro Gorbachev, uh, She's worked in various art institutions in Ukraine, and Tatyana is curating a public program of the Ukrainian Pavilion at the 59th uh, Venice Biennale de dedicated to decolonization. So, thank, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for being in this uh, um, amazing event and for the generous presentations uh, of the speakers, which really inspire different thoughts and layers uh, of the topic. And as I don't have any background in music, my, my uh, input would speak about and would concentrate on actually the role of this particular uh, song and this, let's say, story of cultural diplomacy mm -hmm. of Ukraine. And just before I um, go through my notes, I wanted to share some insights that I had while listening to your presentations. And one is how we went to Shedrovati in Volita when I would visit my grandparents. And uh, um, it was late eighties and we would just go out of the streets in the middle of, of, of the night. Uh, it was late <laughs> night for us back then in the cold winter. And we would, you know, yell these songs. And <laughs> it literally reminds me of my childhood day. And I didn't know that we were taking part in this, you know, very powerful ritual, but just like some ritual that was very basic and we would all follow. Um, it was just part of our life. And the second was from um, actually the memory from my uh, first university years when I was fascinated by the creation of the uh, tragedy in ancient Greece, which actually came from the Bacchus ritual, the, uh, the, 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 actually the autumn, uh, the harvest ritual that was dedicated to the god Bacchus, who was presented as a goat, and he actually was killed. And that, you know, the killing of the goat and singing over the, 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 the rebirth of this god was the key to creation of the tragedy. You know, perfect, which actually came that became then the symbol of the uh, the Christian um, um, ritual, the, the Christian uh, song. So I mean, how interesting is this all interwines in this one song, and we can actually speak about the world cultural history. You know, just speaking about one Ukrainian song. So I think it's amazing. Um, and um, as we're talking about here, about this uh, this particular song that became a triumph of Ukrainian culture 100 years ago, and uh, then how its Ukrainian connection faded, and we are uh, bringing back the, the knowledge about its origin now, I wanted to, um, to make us uh, think about other examples of uh, similar cultural pro projects or cultural um, products actually yeah that um were connected to ukraine that traveled elsewhere or were appropriated by other cultures and actually its ukrainian identity was shadowed and never brought back and uh um i just want to uh, suggest on how we look at this particular song of shadrick as a different case as a totally different story uh from many others 
um, because of its colonial position in the past, Ukraine could not uh, claim and return a lot of its cultures for decades or even maybe centuries. And uh, one of the reasons because Ukraine was not allowed to have something important or valuable in its culture, or it was not supposed to be presented as Ukrainian. And it was fair for both inside or Ukraine or abroad. And uh, in particular, uh, Russia exhausted Ukrainian Ukraine for centuries, either looting its heritage or appropriating its talents. And I just wanted to bring another example from visual culture and my work with Kazimir Malevich, who was born in Kiev, who was actually raised in Ukraine, inspired and taught by Ukrainian folk artists, but he was not able to get any professional art education in Ukraine and um, because there was just no place. So he was, he was forced to go to Moscow to get education and become an artist. Otherwise, he could stay in Ukraine. And maybe if he would be born a bit later, he would have the chance to go to the Ukrainian Art Academy, which was uh, established only in 1917. And it was one of the first things that was created by the newly established Ukrainian National Republic. And um, um, uh, that the creation of this Ukrainian Art Academy was a very similar act of uh, state agency to the uh, Korshets to acquire, you know. So it was this um, act of establishing a state institution um, in the case of uh, the tour, the Kapala tour, uh, establishing cultural diplomacy institution for the state, and uh, with the Ukrainian uh, Art Academy establishing the art institution that, that would last. In those cases, the institution went on longer than actual state existed. So um, even when Ukraine was occupied, both the Ukrainian Art Academy and the cultural diplomacy of the choir went on doing their job. And there are many, many cases um, when Ukrainian culture is regarded as part of other cultures. And we talk uh, sometimes about this as, as part of contested heritage, so-called contested heritage. And uh, we need to prove that something belongs to Ukraine or belongs to Ukrainian culture. And working, work, doing this work, we call it decolonization. Yeah? So, like, we are trying to bring back this uh, 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 the history of of, of this thing. Um, uh, but in order to do so, we have to fight usually and to um, bring back this culture, which was either physically looted during the centuries uh, and kept now in Russian museums, for example, uh, or we have to literally edit their bias, the artist bias in Wikipedia, which kind of call all these Russian people, Russian artists. Um, but in the case of Shadrach or Carol of the Bells, the story seems to be different. And for example, um, here, I, I think we can speak about the shared heritage, not about contested, but the shared heritage. Um, because at first place, this, uh, this, this um, music was meant to be shared. It was intentionally brought from Ukraine to tell about Ukrainian culture and to inspire others to initiate this cultural exchange. And this inspiration created something different, something new, something common or joined with other cultures. And um, so we don't really want to, to, to say anything about contested heritage because actually no one denies that it's Ukrainian, you know, no one denies its Ukrainian roots, even if for many years it was kind of forbidden, but we just have to remind this history, we don't have to fight for it, you know, it's kind of obvious for everyone. So I think in case of Carol of the Bells, we have an experience of cultural, intercultural cooperation or intercultural exchange that doesn't intend to actually destroy Ukrainian culture and neglect its existence. It's not appropriating anything. It's just an exchange of equally valuable cultures. And um, so this shared heritage allows us to build a common today and um, um, imagine a joint future, a generous future, I hope, for both Ukrainian and American cultures.
Thank you so, so much, Tatiana. Um, now we have some time for questions. So whether you are present here in person or online, um, we welcome your questions and our esteemed panel will address them. Uh, I mean, we went through so many things. Uh, just, you know, thank you for talking about the origin, the pre-Christian origins, and so all the way through a uh, wonderful presentation on also on in the European history and the development of world music and its meaning in the modernist and, our, and <laughs> international aspects of it. And so happy that Professor Yefemo is still able to join us for KU uh, retreat. Uh, so please, this is a great opportunity to talk to these amazing specialists if you have any questions ahead of the big the big concert, which please remind people what time is it when? Yes, so it's Sunday at two o'clock. At Carnegie Hall. Um, it's almost sold out. So mm -hmm. if you haven't got your tickets, I encourage you to do so. Um, uh, yes. Carnegie Hall. Sorry. Yeah, yeah Carnegie Hall. Tina, and then, yeah. uh, first, uh, let me thank you uh, for this amazing panel. My name is Tina Ismerdeva, and I'm the director of the Institute. It's rare for us to have such an uh, exciting panel. So, um, a question about, um, we all know how popular the species is uh, in North America. Now, but how, what is its life in Europe? Um, and um, a second question, which has a long prehistory, because uh, when Nora and I were talking about the concert uh, in January, <laughs> and we're all working on this world, the idea is that it focuses on um, jazz covers of this piece, jazz interpretations, and um, for obvious reasons, uh, our attention was focused elsewhere after February. Uh, and I'm thinking myself that we never did that because it would have been time, right? Well, maybe we'll do it next year. Um, but um, is there any, um, do you have any thoughts about this alternative life of the piece um, in the jazz uh, you um, Or do you know of someone who works on that? Um, yeah, I can speak to that. Um, second question. The, the second question, right. First question was about she, its life in Europe. We know that it's very popular yeah. in the US. Does it have similar? Just from my personal experience, um, I've lived a good part of my adult life in Europe. It's it's not quite as popular, like it's known, but it's not. I mean, here, this time of year, I mean, it's everywhere. The first lady just posted her, like, the Christmas decorations are up in the White House video on Twitter. The background music is genetic. like it is so so just everywhere and people know it in Europe but it's not quite as like prevalent I'm not sure if that's because the text isn't you know aside from Great Britain the text is in a different language either text is in a different language from what you know a lot of Europeans are, are speaking but it's known it's not quite as as intensely beloved um Speaking to the the jazz connections, and actually, I feel like this piece in general has had you know a whole different life in popular music spheres, not just jazz, but beyond jazz, are all kinds of of covers of this work by pop artists in Ukraine and also in the U.S. Um, there's a great Razum has a great playlist of Shedrick, um, various versions of Shedrick on YouTube. Right now. <laughs> I think one of the reasons why it has had that have that life is really intimately connected to all of its history. And it has to do with it, the ostinato elements, the repetition, you know, the things that made it singable for children, the things that made it singable for people to remember if they didn't, you know, they couldn't write down the text. So it, it was simple to repeat. I mean, those kinds of things are very also common in popular music genres and make, you know, they make a catchy tune, they make an earworm, right? I think that that's definitely part of it. I also just want to mention that, um, you know, this was performed here in New York very much in the jazz age originally mm -hmm. in 1922. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of appearing in the American world at the same time that jazz was also very, you know, very prevalent. 
And there's actually some really fascinating Ukrainian connections to American jazz, a number of important composers and pedagogues of American jazz musicians actually emigrated from Ukraine. Um, and we do do a little tiny nod to this on the concert on Sunday. I won't say any more. I will just tease you with that. I just want to quickly add also that, you know, a lot of the repertoire that became jazz standards of the Christmas Carol set was also kind of of the composed, like Tin Pan Alley, 1920s, 1930s variety. And so the fact that it enters in along with Sleigh Bells or whatever is, I think, also a kind of happy uh, historical co confluence. I just want to quickly note that uh, about a month ago, I got an email from jazz musicians in Los Angeles asking me about copyright issues for it. And um, and I told them, I have no idea, so you'll have to be a lawyer. But they sent me, they said, I, I will send it to you, um, Dora, because they sent me this very sort of easy, smooth jazz version that we created. Make sure you have that. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. You can add it to the playlist. Yeah, yes. Yeah. I don't but know then know there's, a rap version. there's a there's a fabulous rap version by a Nigerian Ukrainian rap artist called Little Leaf, which made in Ukraine. And I think Zelensky is like makes a candid, you know, candid moment. Um, we're not sure if it's just his voice, but it's a, it's a very good faith for it's for it's him. <laughs> Um, so I, I highly recommend that version as well. And it actually melds the English and Ukrainian lyrics. He like does one verse in English, one verse in Ukrainian. Well, before we get to this, actually, this was, I wanted to follow up on this, to kind of extend this question to Vitana, because I, you know, over the years of spending Christmases in Ukraine, I've noticed that, uh, you know, what we identify here as Christmas Carol, American Christmas Carol music, which we've been inundated since last Thursday by, uh, uh, more popular in Ukraine, you hear it more on the radio. Uh, so have you noticed in Ukraine, like when they hear Carol of the Bells, not Shedden, but Carol of the Bells, what the reaction is in Ukraine to that? Is it kind of a sense of pride? Is it, obviously they recognize that it's Shedden, or, or maybe not, maybe there's a generation of those that know it. Do you recall it's in a public sphere, Carol of the Bells in Ukraine? Well, I have to tell you that when I watched the Home Alone first time in the 90s, I didn't recognize that it was the same Shedrick that I was singing when I was like five years old, you know. I was like, yeah, that sounds familiar, but maybe all the, you know, all the Christmas carols sound like that. It was like something for me uh, not, not expected at all. I wouldn't think that, you know, the Ukrainian song could make it as far as to the Home Alone movie, you know. Like, I, I didn't know what would be the way for it. And the story of the uh, Koshitz uh, tour well, the, the, the Capella tour was not uh, a commonplace. So it's only recently, thanks to the research that Tina did and a lot of the promotion that this story had in, in the past years, that now everyone, of course, knows that. And everyone is kind of proud that, yeah, we can do that. You know, Ukrainian culture can, you know, fascinate people. We can inspire people, give something to the world, something that everyone relates to. But um, I think it was not, the case even like 10 years ago maybe so it's just like very recently that we have this awareness and we you know we um give respect to ourselves that you know ukrainian culture is not a small unimportant um, um peasant something which the soviets or the russians would always tell us that you know you are just like miserable people like second type country we are the equal european culture that can share, that can give, that can inspire, that has a lot of treasures in our uh, past, even if some of them can be appropriated by others or looted and we don't have access to them even, you know, like physical access, but it's still part of our culture. It was created here, it, it has roots, it has connections, it has those past and future, you know? So, I mean, now I think we get more sensitive and more uh, awareness of it. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we have a question here, and let's not forget that uh, Professor Yevdamos is still able to ask questions. We'll translate it necessary, uh, to answer questions. Yeah. Um, very good question for me, and let me make the mic also um, about the, uh, the program of the concert. Um, there are several uh, leading Ukrainian communities in the program, and I just wanted to, um, to hear about um, how, how did you choose uh, these composers and this specific piece? And what, what do you want to tell them? World, then, by this. Um, 
I mean, as I, I said, I think that Leon Povich, the composer's living today, is still, he is still very much an important, significant figure in this tradition of acapella choral music that he, you know, is this incredible pioneer of, it's still very important to composers, living composers. Um, we, what we wanted to do was to, in some ways, mirror what Kwashitz presented in the original concert in 1922, which was a combination of more traditional um, choral repertoire and also works by, at the time, contemporary choral composers. So we're kind of taking that 100 years into the future and doing this combination of, of the same. Um, and then we decided on the repertoire in, in consultation with the choirs. So to some extent, it was, you know, what is in your repertoire? What are you comfortable singing? You know, what do you enjoy singing? What do you think shows off your te techniques? Um, and then beyond that, um, we looked for, so, so I would say those are the more um, traditional choral works by contemporary composers. And then we also chose several choral works by contemporary composers that engage English traditions. So where English texts are set or where English Christmas carols are being engaged in some way as a way to show that like, yes, the Ukrainian influence came here and was really significant and had this amazing impact that we don't, I think, even realize the, the extent of but also that like this exchange continues and that you have Ukrainian composers today who are also looking at, you know, English speaking cultures, English speaking texts and thinking, how do I make, you know, how do I say something with these texts myself? Um, so those, those were, that, I hope that answered your question. Yeah. I would just add that also that, um, I think there's, just as you were talking about an eagerness to share that, you know, these Ukrainian composers, um, uh, Lunyov and um, Shaligin, yeah, um, they want to build bridges. You know, they don't want Ukraine music to be perceived as just within its own silos. So I think the fact that they want to compose in English suggests that, hello, we're here. Um, and I think for this concert, uh, the committee wanted to, uh, the world to, or the audience to know that it, you know, it, Ukrainian music did not stop in 1922 and that choral techniques continue to develop. So in Shaligin, for example, he uses sort of more extended vocal techniques in it. Um, and I would also say that, um, as I alluded, that the, it's extraordinary how Ukrainian composers are trained in vocal writing. And um, John Adams, a, a, the leading American composer, just gave a talk, he composed a lot of famous operas, um, just gave a talk at Juilliard and he lamented that in his six years, he literally said this, and my six years of uh, training as a composer, I never had a class in vocal writing. Never. And here's somebody who's composed lots of operas. And, and this is so not true in Ukraine. I mean, they it's part and parcel. It's in their blood. And the sounds that they create, Bunyov and um, and Shalikin and other composers, uh, Lesya Dichka, Irina Alexei Chuk, these sounds are, are phenomenal. And, and again, they, they don't come from the page. They come from that experience of sound. It also comes from a respect for choral music. And when I first went to Kyiv, actually second time I went to Kyiv in 1997, I watched rehearsals of Dumka and of the Kyiv Chamber Choir. These were full-time choirs. People, it was their day job. These singers showed up at, you know, whatever, 10 in the morning and rehearsed all afternoon daily. In America, there's only one choir I know of in the whole country that respects choral music making this way. And so I, I think what people are going to witness on Sunday is just when you invest in choral music like that, the fruits of that. Um, so there's a lot. Thank you so much. Uh, are there any more questions? We're just about out of time, but we can squeeze in one more. Yes. It's not fully baked, so we'll see how it comes out. Um, I, I'm singing with um, Ukrainian village voices who are not, not, not a part of this concert, but I, I wonder what the relation, I mean, obviously the origin of Shedek is based in folk music and um, what we know in my group is, is that, you know, it, the same song is going to have 10 different versions, you know, between 10 different villages. I wonder if 
And if you guys just know anything about like the relationship of Shadrik or Shadrukia, like in like that very like folk village context, um, and maybe like what that looks like today, if, if anything. <laughs> sure. Uh, Pani Jevhena, czy wy chodźcie wid powiedzieć na te pytania? Ja może tutaj klarkę na ukraińskie. Tak, proszę, jak się, jak, jak się pytanie do mnie, to ja odpowiem, jak się ja znaję tak. do odpowiedź. To, to pytanie pro współczesny kontekst szczedrowania w Ukrainie i jak, jak mieć stelany wydrizniające szczedrówki zaraz? Może wiem, wiem że to będzie jaki rejon, nie do mnie nie powiedzieć. Я зрозумів. Ну, в принципі, в сільській традиції цей звичай живе і досі. А вже як дорослі навчать своїх дітей щедрувати, то вже інше питання. Але навіть в Києві діти ходять в таких в багатоквартирних будинках, діти ходять по квартирах. І теж щедрують. Чи не можете просто проведе, щоб я приклала? Так, так, так. Добре. Um, so the of, of щедрування continues in Ukraine today. Uh, I already forgot the second sentence. And then the third sentence was that even in Kyiv today, maybe someone else heard it. Um, in Kyiv today, children still will, even in like Kyiv, children in the big um, massive buildings will, will go caroling. Oh, and he said the, the yes. question of transmission also is a kind of open question, right? Like how parents pass it down to their children. Yeah, we want to prove those of us. Так, так. І так само діти, як і раніше, ходять по двір'ях і під вікнами теж щедрують, як і колись. Коли я їздив, було таке, що ми з дружиною, з моєю, і з сином, який тоді, тоді ще був маленький, я приїхав записувати фольклор, ну і брав, взяв з собою сина. І от якраз це був такий передноворічний вечір, і мій син пішов щедрувати разом з сільськими дітьми, приніс цілу торбу всяких солодощів, так що традиція ця живе. Uh, so when he uh, would go on field, I feel like everyone can understand that um, accurate. Um, when he would go on field expeditions, um, he would bring his wife and sometimes his young son, and he's recalling an occasion where his young son got kind of incorporated into the village Shedrovanya uh, practice and left with a lot of sweets. So it's very, very fun. Tak, tak. Інша справа, що діти, як їх навчили, так, так вони і щедрують. В міських умовах, от, в, 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 по, по, нашому, по наших квартирах, ходять діти, які щедрувати не вміють, як правило, в місті. Але вони знають слова щедрівок і вони починають просто так скандувати. Я можу зараз вам продемонструвати, в мене є під рукою запис, як от діти зараз просто щедрують, не вміючи це робити по колишньому. <laughs> so he is offering to play a short uh, excerpt of how children today in Kyiv who don't actually know the proper and haven't kind of learned properly how to do this shedruki, nonetheless know enough about it and know the text enough that they still do it today. Давайте можемо, якщо це коротенький запис, послухаємо. Так, дуже коротенький, так, буквально там на, 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 на кілька секунд. Тільки я, я можу, можу продемонструвати, так? Я, я, мені... Так, добре. Ем... Ну, ось, наприклад, так. Коли ходять так щедрувати діти старші, то я їм відкриваю, вони щедрують, а потім я кажу, а чому ви не співаєте, треба хоч трошки співати. Вони кажуть, ми не вміємо. Я їм тоді даю цукерок і кажу, якщо ви не будете вміти по-справжньому щедрувати, то наступного року не приходьте. So he's saying that when the children come to his door and they do this kind of a performance without even attempting to sing, he'll open the door and give them a treat and he'll say, why aren't you singing? 
And they're like, well, we don't really know how to sing. And he says, I'm gonna, <laughs> next year, if you come back and you still don't sing, I'm not going to give you a treat. <laughs> I think we can end on that wonderful note. Thank you so much for this. Thank you. Yeah, we'll buy for our chair if you'd like to take some of that. Oh, yes, please. Oh, you can use that. Stop. It's on Sunday. At 2 o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Bella Lake and Donner Association of America. Oh, and we had a study tour in 1980. And when we renew my friend Judy Sherman, 